Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and we're continuing our series of interviews about offshore tax havens, 20 to $30 trillion at least involved in money that's being hidden from various governments around the world so that they cannot be taxed. And of course, the biggest banks of the world are helping engineer all of this. And all of these biggest banks, one way or the other, do business in the United States and in theory should be touched by American regulation. So where is the regulation and is there any transparency for all of this? Now joining us to talk about possible public policy solutions to this is James Henry. He's an economist, attorney, investigative journalist. James served as chief economist at the international consultancy firm McKinsey & Company. He's on the global board of the Tax Justice Network, and he was the lead researcher of the recently released report, The Price of Offshore Revisited. Thanks for joining us again, James. Quite welcome. So I, I guess the demand is, is there needs to be transparency, and you'd think it'd be kind of obvious that the governments of Europe and, and North America could, if they had any motivation, make these banks disclose all of this. Is anything happening on that front? You know, you have the OECD talking about these issues for uh, more than decades. Since 1995, they started tackling so-called offshore havens. But their approach to the problem was to single out little islands like uh, Vanuatu and uh, Nauru and South Pacific and uh, the Seychelles, Mauritius. You know, it was a laundry list of about 80 of these little island players. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, very little was accomplished with all of that blacklisting. This industry has not gone away. It's just uh, shifted to uh, other places. The orchestrators of this, the systems operators, if you will, uh, are the big banks uh, that we described before, the uh, largest players in the world. And uh, they are, you know, sort of, they don't really care whether one particular haven lives or, go or dies. They'll just move on to the next one. So uh, this requires collective action. We just haven't been able to get the political will together to have that because, you know, at the, at the end of the day, many of the countries involved in this are first world countries like the United States, the UK, uh, Switzerland that have a, a big stake in the game uh, continuing on as it has. So one of the things you see in the pattern of prosecutions, even when you have a big serial violator like a Citibank or a uh, HSBC, HSBC was recently handled, uh, handed, handed a $1 billion fine by the Department of Justice three weeks ago for laundering $14 billion of cartel money. Uh, but, you know, if, HSBC is a huge institution. It has $20 billion of profits last year. So that's like a parking ticket. Uh, what you don't see is the Justice Department willing to go in and shut one of these institutions down, uh, like they did with BCCI back in the uh, 1990s. BCCI was a Pakistani bank that was involved in all kinds of chicanery and money laundering and arms dealing. But, you know, so is HSBC. I mean, they were facilitating trade with Iran. They were facilitating... Uh, the Colombian cartel laundering money, and they were telling their compliance officers to back off. So this is an organized conspiracy, it went right to the top. And yet you have the current chairman of HSBC is a guy named Stephen Green. He's actually a reverend in the Anglican Church. He is the current sitting UK trade minister in the UK in the David Cameron's conservative government. This guy is the chairman for 10 years of this criminal enterprise. So there's very little uh, willpower on the part of uh, the U.S. Treasury or the, uh, you know, the authorities in the U.K. so far to crack down on the HSBC. That's just one example. There are numerous others of where these large institutions have been able to have virtual impunity for, you know, not only the, the their role in the financial crisis and their LIBOR, LIBOR rate rigging. And their, so. Yeah. What do you make of the media coverage of all of this? I mean, you've got the media constantly talking about the crisis, the debt crisis, both in the United States, they talk about the European debt crisis, and the you know we get up practically apocalyptic in the language, but I, you you never hear discussion about well if there's such debt, how about going after all all this offshore money? I I see almost no mass mainstream media coverage of the issue. It's dismal. I mean, I've been writing about this tough topic basically since uh, the early '80s. And I've had a chance to look at uh, the media coverage in detail. You have a lot of journalists who don't know anything about uh, the subject, and they're moving from one story to another. So you're getting, you know, like this week, I had two minutes on CNN uh, to explain this topic, and half of it was devoted to the response that they had to get from the conservatives, none of whom had uh, 
I, I would describe them not as conservatives, but as reactionaries, uh, none of whom had read my paper uh, or had, you know, bothered. They just had the kind of knee-jerk response, but there's this notion of uh, fair and balanced that they had to dig in. The second bias that, you know, sort of novice journalists have is that uh, they tend to target the public sector. It's easy to rail against government. Uh, but, you know, we tend to forget that this latest financial crisis was not really made in Washington. It was made by this lobby, by this very influential uh, bunch of uh, banks around the world that uh, pioneered securitization. And, uh, you know, I knew them very well at McKinsey. When we were there, they were, we started talking about securitization as a strategy banks uh, ought to have. And uh, it, it proliferated from the 1980s on throughout the industry to the point where they were securitizing student loans and real estate and car and cars and everything else and selling securities to, uh, you know, to people that they didn't understand. So th th what happened over time was that this uh, banking industry basically had its way with the regulators in Washington uh, as a result of the vast amount of uh, influence they were uh, wielding and the money they were uh, flashing around. So, you know, this is not an uncaused cause. I mean, it's not the public sector in the Europe, European case uh, or in the United States that was responsible for the or origination of this uh, economic downturn, which then led to financial crisis in the public sector because of all the, the collapse of tax revenue and the continuing spending that had to be done just to keep uh, hospitals and schools and, and roads. Uh, right. You know, so so if you have a situation where, you know, some people have described this as sort of parasitical capital, but if you, if you have a situation where they deliberately and fraudulently manipulate global interest rates, they deliberately uh, uh, help the super rich avoid tax, and, and add to that, enormous amount of manipulation going on on the, on the price of commodities, both in terms of hoarding and creating psychological uh, bubbles for, for shortages and, and such to, to raise prices, and then taking advantage of low price of commodities in order to increase concentration of ownership. So, so, but you have this little financial elite with so much political power that they don't get regulated. So what do we do? Well, you know, I'd like to describe this, first of all, as, uh, as a, as a market-based solution. Uh, I have uh, my very good friend, uh, Professor Kotlikoff at BU, is a lifelong Republican. Um, no one I've ever heard gets more agitated and upset about the behavior uh, of these big financial institutions than he does. And, uh, you know, we've uh, lately decided to collaborate on, on an article where we talk about supporting Sandy Weil's uh, latest proposal. Sandy Weil was the uh, chairman of Citibank in the 1990s and helped to get the Glass-Steagall Act repealed by working his way in Washington. That allowed these big mergers of, of financial institutions and allowed the investment banking and retail banking to come together. But Sandy Weil called for reinstituting Glass-Steagall, uh, which would basically require us to break up uh, these investment banks that have merged with retail banks. And uh, so, you know, this notion of, uh, of, of actually breaking up the big banks uh, as a step beyond regulation uh, is one that I think, you know, Kotlikoff and I are now working on an article that would argue for uh, breaking these banks up not only a basis of needing uh, uh, to bring back Glass-Steagall and to stop the speculation, but also that, you know, we've had an enormous amount of criminal behavior here. This is, uh, from one standpoint, these institutions are, you know, too big to be honest. Uh, and they're kind of beyond the reach of any particular country's uh, jurisdiction. Even the United States has trouble doing anything but reaching a deferred prosecution agreement with uh, HSBC or UBS. Uh, they just seem reluctant to break them up. But it's part, so of, part of the problem here that the... Uh you know, the elites in the different countries, too many of them are on this gravy train, and that's where the political power is. Well, who do you think has these offshore assets uh, with these banks? I mean, who do you think is, uh, is being lobbied every day by these institutions, and which have enormous inside ex uh, access? And who is, in the case of the UK we described before, serving as the Minister of Trade, uh, but the chairman of HSBC? There's a revolving door here that goes on between the, within the elite uh, so it's kind of a club that we need to uh, to break up, and I don't think that's a, uh, you know, I consider myself an independent, not a Democrat or 
a liberal. I, I'd like to see capitalism uh, healthy and, and wealthy and have all of us being able to participate in that if we can achieve that. But in this situation, it seems like uh, a tiny few have been able to get a lock hold not only on the wealth, but also on the political influence. Well, we'll see if, 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 if uh, perhaps that horse left the barn a long time ago. I, I'm not sure you can put it back in again. But uh, I wish you well. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.